we're not trying to demystify Revelation. There is supposed to be some mystery to Revelation, but it's also supposed to be understandable and understood. It's written to be understood. So at the same time, we are not trying to demystify Revelation, but what we are trying to do is help us to understand why it was written, to whom it was written, why we are supposed to be able to understand it. Like the very name of this letter is called Revealing. Revelation is about revealing, not about hiding, not about freaky end time stuff that's unknowable and in the distant future, not let's set up uh, like a whiteboard and try to map out historical events and match them up with what we read in Revelation. It is a recapitulation, meaning uh, it's taking everything that's gone before in Scripture and trying to put it into a letter that reveals Jesus. There is so much of the Old Testament prophecy and history that is revisited or at least alluded to or directly quoted in this letter of revealing Jesus to show the readers and to help us understand that everything that has come before has pointed to this one pivotal person in history whose name is Jesus. And the letter is called Revealing Jesus. That's what we're we're calling it. Uh, So far we've seen some of the symbols, and and as we've seen, lots of numbers and symbols are signs that point to significance. They point to some meaning. And it's the meaning that the sign is there for, not the sign itself. So what we're trying to do as we're reading this book is to read it as it was meant to be read, where we read poetry as poetry, we read history as history, We read doctrine as doctrine, and we read revealing literature as revealing literature. So what we don't want to do is see the sign and stop at the sign and go, wow, that's an amazing sign. Kind of like, you know, you're um, you're at the base of Uluru, and there's a sign there that tells you about Uluru. And all you do is you look at the sign and say, wow, that is a phenomenal sign. But you never look up and see the magnificent rock before you. Or maybe, you know, Grand Canyon or uh, an amazing sunset. You go down to Glenelg and there's a sign there saying, we have the most amazing sunset. And you're there at sunset. You're like, this is amazing. I'm here at sunset and here's the sign that tells me all about the amazing sunsets. But you never look up at the actual thing that the sign points to. We don't want to make that mistake with Revelation. These the signs point to significance. We want to see what is the significance so far, we've seen a bunch of these with numbers and with symbols. <clears throat> but we don't want, again, what we don't want to do is uh, read the book of Revelation in a way that is not meant to be read. Uh, so far, we've seen seven lampstands, which are seven churches, and to the seven angels of these seven churches, Jesus writes a letter with seven sets of warnings, encouragements, and promises. We've seen a throne room with four Creatures, four living creatures with four uh, um, different kinds of appearances representing all kinds of creation. We've seen in the throne room 24 thrones surrounding another throne. And on that throne uh, was the one seated on the throne. And before the throne and among all of the Uh, One seated on the other thrones called elders and these four living creatures was the lion lamb. Looked like a lamb who had been slaughtered and all of heaven worships this lion lamb. As you kind of look back as this person who's writing this letter of revealing Jesus, uh, whose name is John, is looking, uh, you know, he sees the throne and then the four living creatures and then more thrones and then countless angels and then multitudes and multitudes of people surrounding the throne. Epic, epic sight. We saw a scroll with seven seals on it that nobody was able to open. And again, you, you, even just in this brief recap of uh, five chapters so far, you're seeing the numbers coming up over and over and over again, which is supposed to be a sign pointing to something significant, um, but it's one of the things that people get really tripped up on, trying to... Under, trying to discern or, or make up or understand what do these things mean where Scripture, at least at this point, has been fairly explicit with what these things mean. <clears throat> these numbers, again, they're a literary device, 
a sign pointing to something significant. I, I remind us of this again because in the passage today, we're going to see some more numbers, some more signs. We don't want to miss the significance because of how cool the signs are. All right. Uh, there are seven groups through oh, of sevens throughout the letter. So um, we've seen the churches already. That's a number of sevens. Uh, we've seen seven seals. We'll look more into the seals today. Next week, there's going to be seven trumpets. Then there's going to be seven particular people. Then there's going to be seven bowls, seven dooms, and then seven wonders. So lots of sevens. In fact, seven lots of sevens. And even within the sevens, like today, as you see, as we're opening the seven seals, there are more subgroups of sevens within the sevens. So again, we don't want to get too wrapped up in the signs, except to the degree that they help us understand what they're pointing to, the significance behind the signs. All right, let's read. We're in Revelation 6 today, 6 and 7. Uh, a very contentious um, part of Scripture. Uh, lots of disagreement about it. What I want to try to do, in fact, what we're doing throughout this series is not to say this is the one true meaning and only meaning that, that you must hold to. Uh, there are people who I deeply respect who, <clears throat> with different hermeneutical frameworks or different ways of understanding Scripture, land on different um, interpretations but largely agree on the main things. So what we want to do is largely agree on the main things, although I am going to be applying uh, a consistent hermeneutic. So we're not going to be jumping between these different understandings. I'm just going to be explaining it uh, how I think it's supposed to be understood. Um, but again, maximizing, hey buddy, maximizing on the things that we all agree on. Like the, again, uh, the signs that point to significance. We want to see what is that significant thing. So let's have a read. I'll pray and uh, we'll get stuck into it. Revelation 6. Then, so after all of these things has happened, <clears throat> remember John was weeping because nobody was worthy to open the scroll. Here's a scroll. And on the scroll came the judgment of God on his enemies and the salvation and inheritance from God and of God for his people, but nobody was worthy. And then one of the angels says, ah, look, the line of Judah. And he, he turns to see what he's heard about and he sees the slaughtered lamb and all of heaven worshipping the lamb. He was worthy. He took the scroll. Then I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, uh, with a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. Now you hear the first four seals. Uh, Maybe a familiar thing to you. The four horsemen of the apocalypse you might have heard of. Even if you haven't read it in Scripture before, you may have seen it referred to in a movie uh, or pop culture or some of this. This is where, well, this is one of the places in Scripture this comes from. That's the first one, the white horse. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another and a large sword was given to him. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a set of scales in its hands. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. But do no harm, do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death. Or your version might say pestilence. And Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of earth, a fourth of the earth, to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long? until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood. So they were each given a white robe 
And they were told to rest a little while longer until the number would be completed of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were going to be killed just as they had been. Then I saw him open the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of hair. Or goat's hair, you might say. The entire moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a high wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. You might have sung some of these words in some very well-known hymns. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. And who's able to stand? Let's pray together. Father, we need your help always when we open your scriptures. We need your help. I want to... We want to come to these humbly, not arrogantly. <clears throat> we need your help in discerning uh, what is your good and perfect will. What is the truth of these words we're reading? We don't want to be puffed up with knowledge. We want to be built up in your love and in your wisdom. And so help us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit today as you do the work in us of conforming us to the likeness of Jesus in our thinking, in our loving, in our behaviour and how we relate to you and to the world. And we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. So we see again the first half of this chapter. Pretty famous imagery, even if you're not familiar with this chapter, famous imagery of these four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it sounds freaky when you say it like that, but if you say the four horsemen of Four Horsemen of the Revealing. Uh, it's less freaky, more accurate, and helps us understand that something is being revealed. This isn't supposed to make us fearful. It's supposed to help us understand what's going on. Each time the lion lamb opens one of the first four seals, John hears one of the four living creatures, again, these magnificent creatures, like phenomenal in their power and awesomeness. He hears one of them each time say, come. And as he hears, he also turns to see and he sees something. We've seen this already. He hears a voice, uh, Jesus' voice, and then he turns around and he sees Jesus. He hears a voice, one of the angels say something, and then he turns and he sees something. So he hears about a lion, but he sees a lamb. Uh, he, well, I mean, we'll see it a bunch of times here, actually. Uh, he'll hear something and then he'll look and he'll see something else. When John looks, he sees a different colored horse with a rider on that horse, and each of the riders is given something. And the fifth seal, he hears and he sees the souls of the saints who have been martyred because of their faithfulness to Jesus, and they are given something. So you see this kind of repetition each time. Uh, one of the four living creatures has come, he sees he sees a horse, a different coloured horse, rider on the horses, they're given something and each of these things signifies something. The white horse and the rider, given a crown, he is a conqueror out conquering. You might think, oh, isn't there a, there's a white horse in Revelation 19, that's Jesus riding the horse. So is this Jesus out conquering because Jesus is the conqueror? We already heard that in the last couple of weeks. No, this isn't Jesus. This is one of the four horsemen and he is a conqueror out conquering. The red horse has a rider. Uh, it said of him that he, he's able to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another and a large sword was given to him. So is he conquering in the first horse? War in the second horse. The black horse says of him, uh, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. Man, this is actually really uh, insightful, very interesting Horse. It's talking about famine, really, possibly even inflation, where a denarius, which was one day's wage, buys you just enough food to survive for that day. They're not in times of plenty. They're, times, they're in times of famine, uh, of hyperinflation, of desperate need among the poor, but do not harm the oil and the wine. 
showing us that the rich will still survive and do all right. So this is times of great inequality and famine. And the green horse, or your version might say the greyish green, so pale green, like a deathly looking horse, the horse of pestilence, uh, horse of death, and Hades, like the personification of the place of the dead. And, and things don't end well for these guys. Death and Hades, if you're familiar with the book, with the letter, a little bit later, things don't end well for those guys. But right now, pestilence or death and Hades are out in the world uh, bringing people to their death. Alistair uh, so Begg said, Four horsemen, the representative of aggression, bloodshed, economic instability, and the fierceness of death. Some people have taken this and gone, okay, well, this must mean because we've got to read Revelation literally, then this must be four distinct portions of time in chronological order. Uh, I don't think that's what's happening here. This is just giving us a picture of the reality of the world in which we live. In, in some sense, as, as Jesus is opening these seals and judgment is coming upon the world, uh, it's a sign of judgment to come, but it's a sign of our present reality as well. Jesus warns us against all of these kinds of, uh, against speculating about all of these kinds of judgments and, and things in the world. In fact, I, I think that um, if we utilize kind of the, the hermeneutic that the, world, the word helps us discern the times. We don't go to the times first to help us discern the world. So what we don't want to do is look around the world now and say, well, okay, we have famine, we have inflation, we have war, we have pestilence or like a, a, you know, a global pandemic. We actually have all of these things happening right now. We have a, we have a conqueror trying to conquer. We've got war, we've got famine and potentially worse famine to come. Uh, it seems like all these things are actually quite concurrent. Now, we must be living in the very end times. And what Jesus helps us do, even before Revelation was written, uh, he helps us to not miss the significance for the sign. That we're so caught up in the sign that we miss what it signifies. It's a trap that leads to living in a perpetual fear of the things that we're seeing here. Oh my goodness, the... The, the blood moon is on tonight. That must be the end times. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Putin's invading Ukraine. He's the Antichrist. This must be the last day. Oh my goodness, I heard about uh, massive earthquakes. I hear the earthquakes are coming at the end. We've got to be at the very end. But really what, what's happening here is this is more of a... That's what I'm looking for. This is a recapitulation of Jesus' sermon on the Mount of Olives, known as the Olivia Discourse. Let me read a bit of it for you. Jesus, oh, let, me read, let me read it. Matthew 24, that's what it says. Uh, this is Jesus talking. They'll hand you over to be persecuted and they'll kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. And then a little bit later, it says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not shed its light. The sun, the stars will fall from the sky. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky. And then all peoples of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. He's not just talking about some very end, like last of days, nothing will happen in between now and then. It's just for the very end. He actually, he warns us. He, in fact, he says, many will come and say, oh, I'm the Messiah. He says, don't go out into the desert and follow those people. You hear war, about wars and earthquakes and rumours of wars. That's not, that's not the end. Don't freak out is basically the message of Jesus. It's like from this day until the very end, all of these things are going to happen. All of these things are going to happen. If you zoom out and, and uh, throughout the last 2,000 years and then pick almost any 
hundred year period, you're going to see wars, conquerors, earthquakes, pestilence, and death. And every single time, if they read Revelation like most Western people read Revelation now, they would be freaking out going, oh, we're living in the very last days. And in, in a sense, that's true because we've been living in the last days since Jesus returned to heaven. We, we are in the last days, absolutely. But all these generations, if they read Revelation literally, not literarily, if they miss the significance for the sign and they think we are in the very last days, it leads to fear, leads to digging bunkers, leads to getting hyper-political, leads to all kinds of foolishness, actually. When the sign of the significance is about to be revealed, or has been revealed multiple times already, and continues to be revealed. So what we're seeing in Revelation, in this revealing, is not a timeline roadmap of the future that we can plot out in a historical linear sense. It's different windows into different periods of time and different angles on the same periods of time. And we'll see this over the coming weeks. Different angles, different windows revealing more about the world we're living in right now. Not some future thing we should be worried about, but right now. And then it tells us how to live right now. We've seen this every single week so far, and we will see this pretty much every single week because it's the consistent, constant message of the letter of revealing Jesus is to reveal Jesus to us so that we wouldn't freak out. So it's not just some future tribulation we should be worried about. It's a recapitulation of what Jesus has already promised that we're living in now and have been since he said it. The next seal, uh, Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal, so four horsemen of the revealing, they're done, they're out already, they're gone. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony he had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long will you, how long until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? And we saw this even last week. Uh, how long till you open up the scroll and send out your justice? How long till you bring vengeance? How long till you say, like, save us? The fifth seal is removed after the fourth, but before more Christians die. And so some people look at this and say, well, all the Christians will be gone during the time of tribulation. But we've been in tribulation for 2,000 years. And even in the fifth scroll, after, if you're taking it linearly, the fifth scroll comes after the fourth scroll and after the tribulation of those times, and yet there's more, there are more Christians to be killed for their faithfulness to Jesus. So again, I think this is, this is a picture for how we should live today. In fact, hope for today rather than fear for tomorrow. This is one of the primary things that all these signs are pointing to. The primary significance of the letter of revealing Jesus is it would have hope for today, not fear for tomorrow, in light of the one who is seated on the throne. The sixth seal reminds us, might remind you, of places like Hosea 10, uh, Isaiah 2, even Luke 23, when all of the people in the world call for rocks to fall on them. Oh, in fact, I should say, in the fifth seal, um, we see seven parts of creation impacted. So again, this number seven. You've got the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the sky, the mountains, and the island. So again, all of creation is talking about. It's, it's the, the everything of creation because of the seven. And in the sixth seal, we see all kinds of people, seven kinds of people. We see the nobles, generals, rich, powerful, slave, every slave, uh, every free person, and yeah, the rich and the powerful. I, I put them in to get together before. All people, all of the people will see, oh my goodness, God is who he said he was. I, I would rather the rocks fall on me than undergo his judgment. Again and again, the call of the letter of revealing Jesus is that we wouldn't put our hope in the things of the world because even the most 
powerful things, people, nations, empires in the world, at one stage will run for the caves trying to hide from Jesus as if that was even possible. Uh, the, the, what's being revealed is that we shouldn't put a hope in Rome or other rulers. We shouldn't put a hope in our economic stability. Shouldn't put a hope in our healthiness. Shouldn't put a help in the absence of war. Shouldn't put a hope in a full belly or the fact that we have food. None of those things. And it's also helping us to not despair when there are wars or rumours of wars. Despair when there are global pandemics and things shut down. To not despair when there's inflation and your money whoo, evaporates to not despair when you, when you get sick or even die. That there's something that is greater, a hope that is more powerful than all of those things, even death. Instead, where should our hope remain? We have this little interlude between the sixth and the seventh seals. Basically, all of chapter seven. We've, we've had four horsemen, we've had the souls of the saints, we've had judgment of God coming out. And then we have this little break. What are, we, what are we covering in the break? What are we seeing? What's Jesus reminding us of? After this, this is chapter 7, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel rising up from the east, who had the seal of the living God. So another seal, a different kind of seal. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels, uh, who were allowed to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, from Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishtar, Zebulun, Joseph, and 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Benjamin. I truncated that, actually reads out all of them, but for a time. After this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who's seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people in white robes and where do they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Like, here's the elder coming to ask John, Who are these guys? And John's like, I mean, you tell me. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The ones seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So again, we see God's judgment. We see just the state of the world in which we are living right now. Like we, we are perhaps privileged, actually, to live in a time when all of these things are so clearly evidenced in our world. And in a time when, because of our, our modern communication, we can see details of all of these things. Uh, we know how many people have COVID, for example. Uh, we, know, we know details of wars, or at least as much as you can you know, understand details coming out of war. Things are bad, Jesus is reminding us, but remember who is on the throne. This is the consistent and continual story of the letter of revealing Jesus. See how the world is. It is tough, but it's not out of control. It's actually, it's not chaos. God is in control. He's seated on the throne and he is making all things new. Considering all the judgment coming with these seals, who could survive? Looking at the state of the world, the, the worst of the world, there are many things in the world that are getting 
better and the evil of the world just on a continuous loop. Coming out of the suffering, this is Jesus' message to these seven churches and to us. Coming out of the suffering that you're going through, remember what's coming. Remember, remember who sits on the throne and remember who is there before him on the throne. You are. You're there. The sufferings of today, uh, Paul writes, pale in comparison. They're not insignificant. He's not saying, well, just sh- shrug it off. He's not saying, well, the, the pain you're feeling now, don't worry about it, it's all good. He's not saying it's not really pain, so like dry your eyes, princess. He's not saying any of those kinds of things. He's just comparing the, the seemingly overwhelming, even sometimes, pain and suffering of the world today in comparison to the glories of God that we share in, in his new heaven, new earth, new creation, uh, make them pale into insignificance, which is not to say, so don't feel your feelings. It's to say, you know how powerful your grief is now. Imagine the power of the glory and hope to come. So it's not a diminish this because this is great. It's a feel the full feeling of the weight of the crappiness of the world and the suffering you're going through and let it be the multiplier with which you compare the glories of heaven. After the sixth seal comes another kind of seal. It's not the seventh seal yet. Different seal. Different different thing altogether. John hears about 144,000 people. So someone tells him 144,000. And then when he looks, oh sorry, he, he hears that 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, this is what he hears someone say. And then when he looks, he sees a great multitude. So again, before he hears about the lion, and then he looks and he sees the slaughtered lamb. Uh, he, he hears about 144,000. He turns and he sees a great multitude uncountable, unfathomable <clears throat> numbers of people who belong to God. 144,000, man, <laughs> this is, again, one of those things, if you look at the sign and miss the significance, um, he's not saying there's 144,000 people in heaven. Uh, if you've heard that, that is, that's, uh, that's foolishness, actually. Uh, I know there have been some sects and cults that have claimed that and then had to revise the numbers when the numbers of their cults got into the millions uh, and, you know, got to do some fancy footwork and whatnot. Uh, it's not what it says. Some people say, well, obviously because we, te- we read the book literally, uh, then it's literally 12,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel. That doesn't stand up either because these aren't, these aren't the 12 tribes of Israel, actually. Uh, there's a few omissions and additions. Uh, you never hear about Joseph being one of the tribes of Israel because Joseph isn't one of the tribes of Israel. His two kids, actually, uh, got to be the two tribes of Israel. One of the tribes isn't there altogether. Uh, one of his sons is in, Manasseh, and one of them, Ephraim, is not in. So what's, what's uh, going on here? These are, these are not the literal descendants of the people of Israel. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about, the, it's a shorthand for all of the people of God and the 12,000 is lots and lots and lots of people. So that when he goes and he actually sees what the angel is talking about, when he hears about the 12,000 and he looks and he actually sees millions of people before the throne of God. We see, um, I mean, some people look at places like Zechariah and uh, so well, the, this is the fulfillment of the promise of the impouring of the historic nation of Israel. Uh, for me, I think that's been primarily fulfilled in the time of Jesus when the people of Israel turned to Jesus. And then the Gentiles have been grafted into the people of God. And so God has one people. We, we are, like you read through 
places like Romans uh, 11, you see an amazing um, gift to the Gentiles who have been grafted into the people of God. It's a wonderful honour, actually, that uh, God has chosen us. It's phenomenal. When you look at a place like Ephesians 2, Paul helps us to understand what's going on here. He says, remember that at one time you Gentiles, you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which Christ Jesus, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. So because of the blood of Jesus, we who weren't, our people have been made his people. It's a phenomenal honour. So I don't think the church has replaced Israel. We've been grafted in. So we can say we are the Israel of God because we've been grafted in, been made one people with the people of God. You see this in places like Revelation 1, 6, 2, 7, 3, 12, 5, 9, 5, 10. We'll see this at the very end, 21, 22. Uh, it says in Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, uh, Isaiah 19, Ezekiel 47, lots of different places promising what we are now living in the reality of. Now these seals of the scroll are being broken. What is this new unbreakable seal? He's sealing the people of God. And how is he doing this? Back to Paul in Ephesians. In him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believe the Holy Spirit is the down payment of your inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So this is not just a future sealing. You are already sealed. Again, this is, we don't, Revelation is not just a book for the very end. We are in the end now. We're in the end days and might be for another 20 seconds or 20 years or 2,000 years. But we who belong to Jesus are already sealed. You are already sealed with an unbreakable seal, the seal of redemption, the seal of possession, the seal of holiness. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of seals. Now, there are seals like we've been looking here, like the, you know, the, the wax seals on a scroll or parchment to, uh, to show you whether or not it's been opened or so that only the person who can open it or is allowed to open it opens it. Then there are other kinds of seals, like you might, you might seal shut a, uh, a safe or something like this to keep what is in there safe. That's why we call it a safe. And you are sealed likewise with the Holy Spirit with an unbreakable seal. And who is sealed? And I love this. Again, showing us that it's not just the historical people of Israel. Who is sealed? People from all different kinds of tribes, all different kinds of languages, all different kinds of nations. But they're all given a white robe. Will we be actually dressed in white? Maybe. But the white denotes purity and holiness, perfection that we've been made perfect, not by our own righteousness, but because our clothes have been washed in the blood of Jesus. Our clothes denoting our own holiness and they are pure white 
because our holiness, our right standing before God has been immersed or soaked or covered by the blood of Jesus. It's phenomenal. This verse, I mean, not just this verse, but, but all kinds of verses like this, and in particular this verse, should stamp out amongst Christians any hint of racism, any hint of feelings of superiority from one race over another race, to know that we will be in the great throne room one day, either linking arms or side by side, shoulder to shoulder, raising our hands, or kneeling knee to knee, hip to hip, with people from all different languages, all different skin colours, all different ethnicities, all different tribes. Even you know, within ethnicities, warring tribes will no longer be warring. This is the most like, wonderful, phenomenal picture of the future and it should be a picture of our current reality. Now we as the people of God, sealed with his Holy Spirit, when I have a hint of superiority or racism, but we side by side, shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip, knee to knee, we'll be worshipping alongside people of all different languages, all different skin colours, all different ethnicities, and even within our own ethnicities, different tribes, kind of echoing or foreshadowing this amazing day to come. He's dressed us the same. He's gifted us holiness, perfection. And we put on these clothes and we're dressed in white. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's phenomenal. So again and again and again, Jesus is trying to help us understand, you, you see the world, the, the, six, the sixth, six seals that have been broken already and you've seen what is in the world right now. But before we get to the seventh seal, let's take a break and remember who is on the throne and remember who is before the throne and remember how we are dressed in front of him. We're not his enemies. The seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Man, that, even in vision form. This must have been phenomenal to go from millions of worshipping, shouting, uh, glorying, singing from the people of God and all of the host of angels and the four living creatures to just utter silence because the last seal was broken. For half an hour, it's a long time. doesn't say what they were doing. There's a sense of just awe. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints in the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. When the, oh sorry, the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So we start with the seventh seal's broken. There's just silence and awe. You've had worship with singing and shouting and now worship with silence and awestruck wonder. And the seven angels, seven trumpets, again, just denoting the, the, complete, the, the completeness of the people in front of them. And one angel with an incense burner and prayers of the saints going up. We've already seen what these prayers are uh, in the previous chapter. Crying out to God, when will the end come? And as the incense is emptied, as the prayers kind of come to fruition, uh, rise up to God, then the bowl's empty. The angel fills the bowl with fire from the altar and hurtles it down to earth. We don't find out anything about what just happened yet. We will get to that soon. 
But what have we learned about the seven seals? We've learned that God is in charge even when the world feels like it's out of control. The world is not out of control. He told us, Jesus told us even when he was still with us, like on the earth. And he tells us again through John, just years later. And he's reminding us again in our reading now. We we are not subject to chaos. God is in control. We are sealed for him in the Holy Spirit, the unbreakable seal. He will bring justice. No injustice goes without judgment. Or those prayers of the saints crying out for justice, uh, the, the angel fills that empty bowl uh, subsequent to their prayers being heard by God and hurdles it to earth. We'll see in future weeks what this thing is, but we see what's around God's throne, what comes from his throne. We see uh, lightning and thunder and uh, an earthquake. And what is he throwing to earth? What's coming down to earth? The very throne of God. It's coming under earth. God has and is making for himself a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the end of the end, or the beginning of the new, won't come until the full number have been brought in. What this helps us understand is that, again, God is in control. He'll come when he chooses to come, and he still has people who he's saving to give us great encouragement with our witness that he is still drawing people to himself. We've seen this in the 10 years of City Light, dozens and dozens and dozens and into the hundreds of times where people have responded to the gospel with saving faith. And God is still bringing people into his kingdom. Not just people like you and me, people from every tribe, tongue and nation and all together today and in the future we're all going to worship God. Lasting suffering will come to an end. That's what we learn from these chapters. Suffering will come to an end. That injustice will be made right. The the war will cease. Um, The hurt will end. The sickness will end. And in fact, every tear he's going to wipe away. It's a wonderful, wonderful promise. If we keep our clothes washed white in the blood of the Lamb, we will be among the great crowd, clothed in white, worshipping God on that day. And just the knowledge of that day helps us live today. Revelation is a letter for us for today. We need to keep in mind who is on the throne who's before the throne, uh, we are. So we live today and every day in light of that day. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you again for your loving kindness towards us, for the saving work of Jesus. We're covered in his blood. We claim nothing else, no other righteousness but the righteousness that comes from our union with Christ, the saving work. Lord, help us. Would you, by spirit, do work in us corporately and your church across the world to root out any feelings of superiority, one race or language or tribe over another, but that we'd live in light of the knowledge that you are calling to yourself. You're making for yourself a people from every tribe, tongue and nation. Help us to not despair, to not be filled with fear when we see or hear about wars or even, Lord, if we come to war, help us not to fear, knowing that uh, war and conquering and famine and economic instability and disease and even death will come, will come to us eventually, Uh, but that you are so far greater than all of those things. Our hope extends beyond death. So let us live as those with hope beyond death. Let's live as those, Father, please help us live as those uh, marked with your spirit, but also in the power of your spirit that sealed us for salvation and for redemption on that day. Help us to 
love like you love, to think like you think, to relate to the world in a way that you'd have us relate to the world, to relate with you how you'd have us relate with you. And Father, to be a people of hope. In Jesus' holy name we ask, amen.